All right, so hi everybody, I'm glad you're here. I just actually started the video and didn't realize I didn't have audio. My buds, which are usually pretty awesome, um, weren't connected to my phone. So yay, okay, cool. So I'll just update you really quick. My oven is preheating. My Dutch oven is in the oven. I've got a tray of water underneath the Dutch oven. I've got two doughs. One of them I'm going to bake right away, and one of them I'm going to set up for um, bulk or for cold proofing in the fridge overnight. Overnight in bannetons. Good, awesome. Okay. So if you were watching earlier, you saw that I just finished pre-shaping this dough. And while I was pre-shaping it, I was explaining, but luckily I've got a second dough so I can actually explain what I was saying earlier without any audio. So we have bulk proofed our dough in clear straight sided containers. Earlier today, when I mixed up this dough, my stepdaughter did it with me. She accidentally spilled some extra water in there. It ended up being a high hydration loaf, but that's okay. Um, I'm experienced enough to know how to manage it. So we've allowed the dough to rise in the bulk proofing containers. We know that it's pretty close to double, um, slightly less because I'm going to cold proof this. Um, and what we're going to do is pre-shape it. So I'm going to get it out of the container and I'm going to show you. So if you were watching just a minute ago when I didn't have audio, how sticky sourdough really is. So one of the most common things that we see in the group and on the page is I followed all of the processes exactly as I saw them in the video and I couldn't manage my dough. It was way too sticky. So if you watch, this dough is extremely sticky. I did just upload a new video to YouTube today that focuses on um, getting your dough ready to cold proof in the fridge over the night. And while I'm waiting for these doughs to settle, I'll talk about that and show you all of that. But first let's look at pre-shaping. So I've dumped my dough out onto the counter. There's no flour, there's no water. Normally at this point you would use a bench scraper. So it's like a rectangular like tool and you would use that bench scraper to start to pre-shape the bread. So when we pre-shape the bread, all we're going to do is start to drag around it and we're going to try to touch it as little as we can because right now it's still very sticky. See it's sticking to my hand. Pre-shaping starts to trap air into the bread and starts to train the gluten structure that we're going to shape this bread. Pre-shaping is an extremely important process and it can also make overproof dough much easier to handle. So as we work around our bread, you'll notice that it gets less sticky and it starts to build a skin on it. It starts to puff itself up and trap air in. And this is a really important thing for oven springs. So when we bake our bread, we want our bread to spring in the oven, right? And the best way to make bread spring in the oven is to have lots of air trapped inside of the dough, as well as to have an escape route for the air, which is our score. Now, if you were just watching a second ago, when I touched my dough, I squished my hand on it, it stuck and came up, and you'll notice now, right? I can touch my dough, it's not sticking. So I've got these two doughs pre-shaped, and I'm just going to let them rest for a second. So I'm just gonna slide them over here on the counter, and I'm going to let them rest. You can notice that this one's already starting to fall. It's showing good elasticity. I'm just going to rinse my hands really quick. And while we're waiting for the dough to rest, I'll just briefly talk about the essential processes, um, the beginner bread recipe, um, the new videos that are up on YouTube, all kinds of good stuff happening. So normally when you pre-shape your dough, you should let it rest for about 30 minutes, 20 minutes or so, whatever it might be. And then after you've pre-shaped your dough, you shape it into your loaf. You can either do a batard, which is like a long um, rectangular loaf, or a bowl, which is a round loaf. Um, in my case, I'm going to, I'll do a round loaf for in my Dutch oven, which is going to go in right now. And then I'll do a bowl in my silicone bannequins. Um, I uploaded a new video to YouTube today. So I've been having, um, I've been finding that with Facebook, 
going live works really well. People get notified, they come in, they learn something, everybody's coming on, they're getting to ask questions, there's lots of people watching, they're super interactive, they're working great. But when I post videos on Facebook, they aren't going, um, they, they kind of get lost. Like when I want to help somebody later and say, oh, watch this video, it's going to help you. It's really hard for me to find them. So I'm starting to focus more on getting the tutorial videos onto YouTube. So you definitely want to go follow us on YouTube. It's at sourdough for beginners on YouTube. And that's where you'll find the beginner bread recipe, the bulk proofing success video, the pre-shaping video. Today, I just uploaded a brand new video, and it covers pre-shaping, shaping, getting your dough into bannetons, cold proofing it overnight, pulling it out of the fridge, getting it prepped and ready for into the oven, scoring it, and getting it into the oven to bake, and seeing it at the end, watching it cut. So that whole second half of the process. So if you've been following for a while, I go live all the time and show the mixing, and then explain what happens later. Um, and I don't often get to the pre-shaping and shaping phase on the lives on Facebook. So definitely check out the description of this video. I have linked everything that you're going to need um, to find the new video on Facebook to be able to go ahead. A um, couple other things. A group member sent me these cool bags. I have hardly any bread left, but I'll show it to you. So let's look at this. So here's my bread. It's in here. These are like beeswax lined bread bags and they're absolutely enormous. You could fit absolutely any size bread in here. So she messaged me and said, hey Sarah, can I send this to you and let you try it? So you put your bread inside of it, you squeeze the air out, you roll it down and then you close it and it keeps your bread nice and fresh. I've been using it for about two days now. I think it's really cool. So I linked those. And then for cold proofing, I'm using these silicone bannetons, which you can also bake in. I did bake in them once. I don't know if I'll do it that often, but you can. Um, these are linked. Um, you've got the link to the beginner bread recipe and the essential processes. So if you're a total newbie to sourdough, if you've never done this before and you're really trying to learn, these lives are great. Um, you can post questions in the comments. I'll be happy to answer them as we go. I keep an eye on the video as much as I can and answer as they come in. And I show sort of wherever we happen to be in the process at that moment. But if you're wanting to say, okay, I just want to sit down and learn and watch all the different steps, all of that's linked in the description of the video for you. Um, new ebook coming. So we've got English muffins, sourdough bagels, sourdough cupcakes, sourdough carrot cakes, sourdough tortillas. Um, hot dog buns, discard crackers, croutons, focaccia scones, bread breadsticks, and this famous like strawberry rhubarb buckle that I make a lot in the summer. Um, we've just almost got the book done. So there's a pre-order available for that where you get a discount if you would like. Um, now, if you're liking these lives, every time I do a live on Facebook, tons of people come in. It's really fun. Lots of people ask questions. Um, on Monday night, every week at 7 p.m., I'm going on an app called StarCam. You can actually upload questions directly to me, and I get to see the questions, like, one at a time. So you can come in and show me your bread and make me a little video, explain, like, what's happening, what issue you have, and I can help you troubleshoot it right there. So StarCam.com forward slash app, and then just, you know, there's an event on Facebook, follow it and it'll notify you and you'll be able to come and ask the questions. So do, do you flour the silicone bannetons? Yes. Um, with these silicone, I do find that the bread will stick to it. Um, I put a ton of flour inside the bannetons and I also flour the top of the dough like a lot. Um, when the dough has stuck to the bannetons, it's been fine. All I do is I just turn the bannetin inside out like this. So imagine your dough is inside there. I'll actually just like turn the bannetin inside out like this and like just loosen it with my finger and then dump it and pry it out. And But there have been times where when I've been using these bannetins where it's stuck quite a lot. But all I do is just put like a nice gentle shape on the bread and it still works great. So... What we're going to do today is we're going to shape both of these breads. We're going to get one into the silicone bannetin to um, cold proof overnight 
And if you want to understand the whole cold proofing process, go watch that YouTube video. And then we're going to get one into the oven to bake right away. So we'll score that one and get it through. So I'm going to, hi Kim, I'm glad you're here. Nice to see you. Okay, so here's our two doughs. They've both been pre-shaped, right? They're ready to go. So now when it comes time to shaping, this is the time when I'm gonna to start to use a little bit of flour. So I'm just gonna lightly um, flour my counter. And I think what I'll do is I'll get the first one into the oven and then once that's in the oven, then I'll shape the other one for the banneton. So when we're ready to shape our bread, I take a piece of parchment paper, right? And I just get a little bit of flour onto the parchment paper just so that the bread doesn't um, burn while it's baking. So I'll just kind of set that aside there. Now, when I'm ready to shape my bread, what I do, so remember, I just pre-shaped this. It's not sticky anymore. I built a skin on it. I built tension into it. Underneath is very sticky. So I'm just going to slide my fingers underneath. I'm going to stretch the bread and I'm going to flip it over like this. And I'm going to open this bread up into sort of like a, a square. Now I'm trying to be gentle at this point, not to lose any air. Thank you. I'm using two in about 30 minutes for the first time. Oh, good. Have fun. Well, I'll show you how to get, if you watch along, then you'll see how to get your bread into them to get prepped for it. So I've got my dough here. So I just finished pre-shaping. I trapped all kinds of wonderful air into this dough. I'm still being gentle with it so as not to degas it. I'm going to take it and fold it like a pamphlet. So I'm going to fold the top third down and the bottom third up. And for my one that's going into the oven, I'm going to make it into a round bowl shape. So for the round bowl, what I like to do is stretch this corner, stretch this corner, stretch this corner, and stretch this corner. And then just roll it, gently stretch it as I roll until it comes around. And then I'm just going to use some of this flour that's on the counter. And I'm going to gently shape this dough into a nice round shape. And then once it's nice and round, since I'm not putting it into the bannetons, I'm going to lift it directly onto my parchment. And I'm going to put just a little bit of flour on top. And the flour on top is just for aesthetics. All the flour on top does is let our, is make our, um, our, uh, our scores show. So there's two kinds of scores. There's a functional score which is the score that allows the steam to escape. That score should be about a half an inch deep. If you're doing a side score, it should be almost parallel to the counter. If you're doing multiple scores, then it can be straight up and down. Just make sure it's about a half inch deep. And then there's aesthetic store scores, which are just kind of pretty, you know? So with this one, I'm going to do a side score. So I'm going to take my razor and I'm going to put it approximately parallel to the counter. And I'm going to cut this nice, beautiful score on the side. And I'm gonna go over it again and make sure that it's a half an inch deep. And then I'm just gonna put some pretty sort of wheat lines. And these ones are only just as deep as the skin on the bread is. So these are all just purely aesthetics, right? So it's that simple. So let's get this into the oven. So I'm just gonna pull my Dutch oven out of the oven. It's been preheating. And let's just bring this here like this. Here we go. And I do have a tray of water on the rack underneath my Dutch oven. I keep that there all the way up until the last five minutes of baking my sourdough. So I'm just gonna take my lid off. Now I put a piece of crinkled up tin foil in the bottom of my Dutch oven. All it does is just create some airflow underneath my bread to keep my bread from getting too, um, too crispy on the bottom. So I'm just gonna take my parchment paper and use it as a sling and plunk it into my Dutch oven. These are four point, I think they're 4.3 quart um, oval Dutch ovens. And I really like these because I can fit two side by side in my oven. So I'm just gonna get that lid on and I'm going to pop this into the oven. Kinda of have to work a little bit quickly because we want that Dutch oven to stay really hot. And then I'm going to take my timer and keep the battery out of it because it dies all the time. And I'm going to set this timer for 10 minutes. So 
there's one last chance to get a good oven spring if you think that maybe your bread might be slightly overproofed, and that's to pull it out about 10 minutes in. And if it looks like your um, score is fusing, um, then you can actually cut that score again. The score is what allows the the air inside the bread to escape. And when it escapes, it goes and creates that oven spring. Is that just bread for all your sprink sprinkling on top? Yeah, I'm just using regular all-purpose flour. Rice flour works really great if you want that, like, deep white look on top where your sort of scores look dark on the inside and you've got that nice white. But here in Canada, we really struggle to find rice flour. I have made some rice flour myself in the past, but my little Ninja um, uh, blender isn't quite strong enough to get it as fine as I wanted. So I took the white rice flour. There's a video for this on YouTube. I took the white rice flour, put it in the Ninja, ground it all up. But then I still had to put it through a sifter because there were still chunks in there. I think it would work beautifully if I had a, a wonderful um, blender, but I don't. Okay, so... Now I've got this other loaf of bread. And what I'm gonna do is put this loaf of bread in my banneton. So I'm going to flour this banneton really well. I do find that if you don't use a ton of flour in the banneton, and I mean a ton, then the dough will stick to it. And I actually don't mind having lots of flour in the banneton because I end up putting more flour on top for shaping anyway. So if you look, I've got lots of flour in there. And when I say lots, I mean lots. So now I'm going to shape this dough into a batard shape and get it into the banneton and show you how I prep the banneton for the night. And probably by the time we're getting close to done that, I'll show you how to cut that second score. So same as last time, lots of flour on my counter. I'm going to reach underneath my dough. I'm going to flip it. And I'm going to spread it out into a square shape. And again, like I said, there is a video I just posted on YouTube that goes through all of this slowly. You can rewind, you can check it all out. With the lives, I like to just show the process, how we actually do it. So I'm gonna do what's called a pamphlet fold. I'm gonna fold the top third down and the bottom third up. And then I'm going to go to the side of my bread. And for a batard, what I'll do is I'll stretch as I roll. And when I'm done, I'll end up with this sort of oval shaped dough that's got the end sticking out. So I just need a little bit more flour on here. So here we go. And now what I'm going to do is tuck the ends. So when we have pre-shaped and now we're shaping our dough, we're trying to keep that air trapped in there, right? We're trying not to degas the dough. So if you've been out there Googling, you might have read the word degas. So we're trying to be super gentle. But at the same time, we're trying to get the dough to trap as much air inside. So when we take our dough and we form it the way we just formed it, and then we tuck these ends in like this, so I had those ends sticking out and I've just tucked them, then that's gonna trap more air in there. And then there's one last step with our banneton that we can take to trap air. So I'm just going to take this dough, I'm gonna flip it, and I'm going to put it seam side up into my banneton. This dough's a little sticky because we got some extra. And then what I'm going to do is sew up this bread. So that's where we just take our dough and stretch the seam over itself just almost like an overlapping. So grab this side and this side of the dough and stretch it over itself. And this just adds, you don't have to do this, this is an optional step, but this just adds that extra little bit of tension into the dough. So here we go. So now we've got this nice seamed up bread. It's in our banneton, right? And we're going to stick this banneton into the fridge and let it cold proof overnight. And I'll probably end up baking this loaf, I don't know, maybe midday tomorrow. I'm just using like a, um, a produce bag. Another thing that works really well is a shower cap. I use this one for my round banneton. You can use plastic wrap. You can use anything you want. But you do want to cover your bannetons in the fridge so that the dough doesn't get dried out. Henry Garcia, so you don't pull the dough to create tension before you place it in the banneton. Henry, I do. Um, I, I pre-shape the dough. So as soon as it comes out of the bulk proofing container, I dump it out sticky 
onto the counter with no flour, no water, pre-shape it, let it build some tension in the pre-shaping, let it rest for a bit until the elasticity starts to spread it. Then I flip it and shape it. And while I'm shaping it, I'm building tension into it, right? I'm starting to push the dough underneath itself, trapping air inside of it. Um, and getting to the point where that dough is starting to have some really good air. Um, and then once I shape it, I'm pinching those ends in and sewing up the dough. So there's kind of these like multiple points where we're bu building tension into the dough. So when you're new to sourdough and you start watching, you see like, oh, I'm pre-shaping, I'm shaping. And we know that these things contribute to how the dough, how the bread ends up looking when it's done. But I don't know if anybody ever really like talks to you, talks to you too much about how um, all of these processes that we're doing are actually contributing to the final oven spring of the dough. So that was a really good question, Henry. I really like it. Okay, so hands are clean, but not again after shaping before banneton. No, um, so no, I pre-shape, I shape, I dump it into the banneton. Once it's in the banneton, so I pre-shape, I shape, I close up the ends, right? So the pre-shaping built some tension, the shaping built some tension, the closing up the ends built some tension. I flip it into the banneton, I sort of sew up the dough. That's the last bit. And then from that point, theoretically, I don't touch the dough again until I store it. So when I put the dough into the fridge, the next day when I'm ready to bake, I'll actually preheat the oven before the dough ever comes out of the fridge. I take the dough straight out of the fridge when the oven is fully preheated, score it, and get it in right away to bake. Theoretically, I'm just dumping the dough out of the banneton straight onto um, the parchment paper and baking it. Not, I'm not touching it. I'm not reshaping it. If your dough has enough strength in it, if you've done... If you've gotten through the essential processes properly, and we definitely, so let so here's the thing. So we've just built, we've just baked a bread and we've just got one set up for cold proofing. I'm just gonna stick this in the fridge. We actually recommend that beginners skip cold proofing all together until they're comfortable with all of the other essential processes. And the reason for that is that if if you've made a mistake early in the process, then cold proofing is just going to magnify it. If you overproofed your dough during the bulk proofing phase and then you put it in the fridge, it continues to rise in the fridge, so it's just going to magnify it. Um, uh, Theano says, how much starter are you using for the two of them? So the beginner bread recipe is linked in the description. Um, the level one low hydration beginner bread recipe, which is designed to make the dough much easier for beginners to handle, uses 120 grams of starter, 680 grams of water, 1,000 grams of flour, and 20 grams of salt. And then the level two hydration, so once you're getting a little bit more comfortable, you're feeling good about the dough, that uses 200 grams of starter, 700 grams of water, and then 1,000 grams of flour and 20 grams of salt. Um, so if you're just kind of coming in right now and going, oh, we've got dough, <laughs> how did we get here? Definitely um, go to the page. So on Facebook and YouTube, both of them are at Sourdough for Beginners. All of the recipes that you'll need, all of the tutorials that you need, all of the anything that you'll need to get through the whole process beginning to end is there. And the description of the video has um, that process. So we just put our dough in. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Definitely ask your questions. I mean, while I'm here, I never know when I'm going to find a chance to go live. Um, my husband and I actually had a really busy day, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, it got not busy. Um, so I thought, you know what? I don't usually go live when I do the shaping and baking portion of um, sourdough, so maybe I'll just do it today, especially since I was doing both a bake and a cold proof. Um, this bread's been in the oven for almost 10 minutes. So we are going to pull this bread out and check the score. So if your dough is overproofed, it won't, it will have lost its strength. So you'll have mixed your dough. Um, do I put my dough in the freezer after refrigerating for a while before baking? I haven't yet. I've been thinking about it. I could see why it would be valid. So I think that 
the idea is that we are trying to get our dough to hold its shape until it can spring in the oven. And what can happen in the oven is um, in, while the dough is in the oven, it can actually spread too quickly and the, the score line that you've cut starts to fuse together before the bread has a chance to pop. Putting your oven in the freezer can help hold the bread up long enough for that pressure to build up inside your bread. So I'll show you what I mean. If this bread of mine happened to be overproofed, then when I open this lid, my score line will be fusing. And it is a little bit, it's not terribly, but if you, let's see if I can tilt this. So if you look, here we go. My score line is starting to be smooth, right? And I can't hold this Dutch oven very long because it's too hot. With a perfectly proofed bread while it's baking, when you pull it out after 10 minutes, that score will still be like an L shape. It'll still be angled. Sometimes when you start baking your bread, you start to see this fused score. So 10 minutes into your bake, you can actually cut that score again, and it's going to give your bread a better chance of springing. So you put all of this work into sourdough, right? You you feed your starter the night before, you get up in the morning and you bake, you spend two hours stretching and folding, you put the bread into um, vault proofing containers, you watch it until you think it's perfectly proofed, then you go to, then you score it, and then you put it in the oven and bake it, and it comes out flat, and it's just horrible. So what we're talking about on this live is how do we prevent that? And the way we prevent that is one, build good air into the dough during pre-shaping, build good tension into the dough during shaping, do a good functional score, and then check throughout baking to make sure that our score is doing what it's supposed to. Once the bread gets into the oven, it starts like this. This happens to me every time I try to do this demonstration, I start making these hearts. I'm not doing it on purpose, but I do think it's really cute. So you've got bread like this, right? And it's in this super hot environment. So the inside of the bread starts to build pressure, right? And theoretically, if your bread is good, it'll go and pop up. And that's how you get those big, beautiful round loaves that you see, those Instagram loaves that you're looking at. You can't get that pop if there's not enough air in your bread. If your bread is overproofed, it can't hold the air. It falls too quickly. If you haven't done a good functional score, lots of things. So my bread is now in the oven. I've got a new timer set for 20 more minutes. So usually what I do for baking, one of the most common questions I always get is how do I bake the bread? There's a million different ways to bake bread and every oven is different. So no matter what, you're going to have to figure out how your oven is going to work. Sourdough needs high heat in order to get that oven spring. So you want to be at least at 450 degrees. Some people start at 500 and then lower the temperature throughout. My oven only goes to a maximum of 450 degrees. So I just keep it at 450 degrees the whole time. I let my Dutch oven heat up for at least 45 minutes before I start baking. I keep a tray of water on the rack underneath the Dutch oven. I bake for a total of 30 minutes with the lid on. So I go 10 minutes, I check the score, cut it again if I need to, pop the lid back on, go 20 more minutes. So I'm waiting on that 20 minutes now. After 20 minutes, I'll take the lid off, put it back in for another 20 or 25 minutes. And then at that point, I'll use like my standard, you know, inexpensive meat thermometer and check, keep checking the bread until it gets to 205 Fahrenheit. Um, when Billy says, I just hopped on, I'll go back and watch the replay. Awesome. Good. Yeah. So uh, basically the reason I came on for the live today was because I just happened to have dough and I thought it would be cool to show how you could take that dough that you bulk proof today and either get it straight into the oven or get it into the fridge to cold proof. Um, definitely go check out that new video on YouTube. The, it covers the whole process. If you're ready to cold proof, if you're ready to add that in, then everything you need to know about getting that cold proofing process done is in that new video on YouTube. But if you're a beginner and you haven't actually ever done sourdough before, know that we recommend skipping cold proofing until you've mastered the essential processes. So also in the description of this video, there's the beginner bread recipe, um, there's the coverage of the essential processes, 
get onto the YouTube channel. There's a starter play playlist. There's a bread baking playlist. And then there's like tons of little videos like, hey, if this happens, then do that. There's lots of discard recipes. Um, so lots of stuff out there. So check it all out. Um, anyways, thanks everyone for being here. If you've got any questions, post them in the comments. If you ask questions, I'll go back through them later and answer them. And later on tonight, I'll post pictures of how this spread turns out. We'll see y'all soon. Bye for now.